The following is a presentation of Morning Drive Media. Broadcasting from beautiful, sexy, steamy Studio City, California, this is the Knapsack Files. I'm Ken Knapsack, back for another classic Knapsack Files edition. Uh, it is the interview show that we do here, the original show. This this network has grown to include other shows, including the, the one that you guys have uh, been uh, very uh, taken to very positively, which is The Three Things. And I was going to do an episode of The Three Things this weekend called The Three Things I Love About David Bowie. And then I thought to myself, nah, if we're going to talk about Bowie, we're going to have to do this right. So I'm bringing back uh, the Knapsack Files resident music expert, Jay Arrett, a.k.a. Jay On Demand on Twitter. Yes. Uh, and if you are a longtime listener to the Knapsack Files, you have heard this man and me ramble and talk for hours, indulging ourselves in uh, our uh, love of music and modern pop rock music. Uh, and, and if you haven't heard those episodes yet, go back and listen to them. Mm-hmm. I think we recorded them, recorded them about two years ago about. now. Yep. Um, and so it's been a while since it's been on the show. And unfortunately, this is how, what we're talking about yeah. um uh, the passing of david bowie but the reason i'm bringing jay on specifically and he's going to sit here and tell you he's not the expert above experts of david bowie no. and i get that he, he's he's uh, he's hedging his bets here a little bit but little he bit. is a uh, musicologist uh, in his own right uh, an encyclopedia of many things and uh he <laughs> is when david bowie passed uh, he was the one of the first people I thought of because Jay uh, took mm-hmm. me to see David Bowie on the reality tour. Um, we'll talk more about that later. And I was so happy that I got to see that uh, concert and got to see Bowie. And though I myself am not a giant Bowie fan, I am a a giant appreciator of Bowie, if that mm. makes sense, the dividing line there. I'm a Beatle guy. People know that. But just being a, a former rock DJ and a music journalist, Bowie has always been one of my favorites. And his songs uh, obviously have touched a chord with many people. And, and, and uh, Jay was one of the first people I thought of. And I tweeted. And unfortunately, I broke the news to him. Yes. So I said it was only right that we come to the Knapsack Files studio today and discuss pay tribute to, and just bask in the glow with David Bowie. So, Jay Arrett, welcome back to the Knapsack. Ken, Ken Knapsack, thanks so much for having me here into steamy Studio City. It is steamy <laughs> it's here. It's a little steamy It today. is. It was kind of hard to find your place. And actually, this is our first podcast from your home you have yeah, you yeah. have home ice for the first time so, home you, ice, so yeah. you, have, you have the advantage here <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm the crowd's gonna be cheering for you yeah more this time yeah because we went up to uh, your place in uh the Cam- camarillo camarillo um, Bill, usa it's true and uh, yeah. i thought about doing that again and, and but then uh uh figured hey why not uh, come on down here then we'll go through, we'll catch up as friends too after this we're gonna grab some dinner mm-hmm. um and all that good stuff but no one out there wants to hear that they want to hear about david bowie but jay uh seriously i i, I know this he is one of your favorite artist he he is my favorite artist ken you and i had once talked about doing a, a podcast we've done our 10 songs we need to live we've done yeah. our 10 favorite albums and we've talked about doing one mm-hmm. of our 10 favorite artists right. and when you brought that up to me i thought okay well i've got my holy trinity mm-hmm. i've got my favorite group in the four albums and over division which is aha and that's the <laughs> story for another day yes please hold mm-hmm. all your derision i've got my favorite band in the three albums and under division which mm-hmm. is Redbox, and i've got yeah. my favorite solo artist which is bowie like those three, like instantly, uh, no brainers. Those would be my top three. The other seven, I'd have to fill in with bits and pieces. You know, Toto. You know, see what you and I, and folks. If you're listening, uh, um, <laughs> it. it, it, it uh, just hearing Jay break it down into those categories is why he's here to discuss this. Because I would just be like, uh, you know, I don't know. I like Seven Sonic. What category is that? Right. Um, but so when did uh, you know we could we could sit here and break down the legacy and history of Bowie, and I definitely want right. to get into that. And there's so much about mm. him. Um, what, one of the things that I loved about him immediately upon his his unfortunate passing on January 10th now of this year, um, I thought about you. I thought about uh, my friend Jessica. And I thought about my friend Stephanie. All three of you giant Bowie fans. Right. In different veins. 
Yes. Uh, for Jessica, he was like, uh, that's her favorite artist, uh, uh, literally in, in terms of art, art and acting yeah. and, and music and everything. And she's more uh, connected to him with the music, but also like Labyrinth is uh, big in her life. And, and there's a whole <laughs> group of my friends that he's he's the Goblin King. Yeah. Oh, where sure. I kind of grew up going, why is David Bowie in that weird Muppet movie? Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and you just told me that there's such a thing as a Labyrinth convention. Yeah. The, well, the la- it's not a convention. It's oh, a ball. It's, so, well, I mean, convention yeah, is an interesting word. Right. It's not so much a convention as uh, the Labyrinth of Jareth Ball, which okay. is uh, – a lot of my friends go to, and then my friend Stephanie was there for the music and and and, and who he was. Um, uh, but it touched her as a you know as a woman in her early thirties. She's going to have a different view of Bowie than than you as as, sure. a, as a white male in your in your uh, reunion. Um, <laughs> so that's why it's so right then Bowie's so fascinating to me sure. because. Um, He's across the board, and yeah, like the Beatles, my band, or even more specifically George Harrison. They're, 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 yeah, it's across the board. A lot of people love the Beatles. It's like food, right. um, <laughs> but um, they all kind of like them for the same reasons. Mm-hmm. And Bowie, that is so diverse in what he's done, you could latch on to little different eras in his music and his career, or his, or his acting and everything, and kind of like him for different reasons. Right. Well, well, that's just it. You know, I, I thought a lot about the Beatles, your band, and yeah. Bowie, my guy, and it really talking about the history. Of music. I mean, you got the Beatles from yeah. the early 60s to what, 70 is it, when yep. they officially broke up. Bowie was still around that. And it's almost mm-hmm. like he picked up that torch and he ran with it. And you can yeah. trace the history of music, mm-hmm. the, the entire pretty much history of rock music through those two. I mean, yeah. Bowie, you know, it, it, it struck me so hard. And, and if I could go back to that night that you told me, and yeah, I, do, I, I, just, I just want to share this too, because yeah. um, it, it, that weekend started out so good. It was, <laughs> it was the missus and I were, you know, we spent all weekend watching playoffs football and sure. we, we hadn't seen the new Star Wars yet. How dare you? Exactly, right? And you know, here, the thing with Star Wars, I'm a fan. She's a fanatic on your level. Got she it. She is huge. Respect, like, respect. I, I couldn't wait to see the movie. She was terrified of seeing yeah. the movie because she was afraid of not liking it. Yeah, and fair so, enough. And that was part of the thing was like, yeah. I, I mean, I kept saying, hey, we got to see it tonight. No, I can't. And it turns out she's like, yeah, I've just been afraid. I have been afraid yeah. of seeing this movie. So we, see, so we saw a seven o'clock show, IMAX, three dimensions, the whole nine yards. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Stunning. Came home. Life is good. We're, oh, this is so great. Aren't you happy, dear? Yes. Aren't you happy, dear? Yeah. Staring into each other's eyes and bing, a text comes through. Uh-huh. And it's one of those Twitters, twit machine things. One of those notifications. One of those notifications. And Ken has, has acknowledged me in a tweet. Like, oh, that's sweet. And I, and, and I, and I, I have it here. And I just, just because I have to actually, you know, read you, just, just take you through what I, what I felt. It said, my pal Jay on Demand, that is me, took uh-huh. me to see Bowie in 05. Which two, I think actually was 04. It, right? it may have been. Yeah. I actually don't remember. Um, two and a half hour show. Every song you wanted to witness. Spellbinding. And I'm like, oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Ken's mentioning me and, it, and he, he remembers that. That was so long ago. And then he ends it with, farewell, thin white Duke. I, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Fair, okay, farewell, thin white Duke. Okay, what, what he must mean is, Bowie has said, I'm not the thin white Duke anymore. <laughs> I've, I've taken that 30, 40 years after the fact. I've gotten rid of that persona. That's not who I am anymore. Which is not on, which wouldn't have been unlike David which Bowie. Which would not have been unlike <laughs> David Bowie. No, the thin white Duke just wasn't for me. Yeah. Uh, that was a terrible Bowie. I promise not to not do that bad, again. But, you know, so, so I've rationalized in my head, that's yeah. what he means. Go to, you know, go to Google it just to verify, just to yeah. make sure that's yeah. what it was. And the minute I get to, the search box and I get to David B, you know, and immediately stories start popping up. David Bowie dead at 69, like uh, shock, just mm-hmm. absolute shock just took me over. Right. And, and it, it just that the whole rest of the night. Well, of course, the first thing I yeah. did, first thing I did, as I think most people did, was pop a 40. Yeah. Drink half of it and pour the other half on my iPod <laughs> as, as, as a tribute. That, that was for you, Lou. Is, uh, is in the other room. Uh, sorry, I, I stole Lou Santini's joke there. But at any rate, no, the, fir- the first thing I really did was uh, after the shock wore off, I realized, you know, his new album came out two days ago. I haven't even listened to it. I got the compact right. digital disc and I haven't even burned it. To, I burn it to iTunes and I pop it on my iPod. I'm just laying there in bed soaking up every story I could find about mm-hmm, about mm-hmm. Bowie uh, and then the next morning I went to Twitter and engaged in the biggest group hug that I yeah. think that I think maybe Twitter has seen yet because yeah. people are from all walks of life yeah. every everybody has has weighed in on it from yeah. sub- celebrities everybody has wa- everybody's got an opinion on it yeah because you know from the surface David Bowie and I'm saying this as a as a former rock DJ who's grown up loving three chords and the truth and <laughs> three and a half minute pop rock songs mm-hmm. Bowie was not always easily accessible 
No. He he did his own thing from the beginning, and sometimes it was a quaint little pop song, and sometimes mm-hmm. it was an anthem. Yeah. Uh, Heroes remains my favorite of his songs because it is it is a, a magnificent anthem. I just listened to the 1996 live acoustic performance of Heroes at the mm-hmm. uh, Bridge School Benefit, and that is a different version, a straight ahead acoustic, acoustic guitar. You got bass, you got guitar there, mm-hmm. uh, and, and a bottle cap tap attached to his foot, um, <laughs> and it's a different song, but the same song because it's such a great anthem but yeah. um um but i think once you got past that and once you accessed bowie it, it was deep yeah. uh and that's where i think some of that outpouring came and just he was so his own man and own performer and i think that resonated with a lot of people yeah i'm, I'm, I'm gonna get sacrilegious here in a moment i mean we're talking about the, the bowie and the beatles yeah who um uh, only a tiny bit of our the beatles are the babe ruth of music yeah right they're they're the first and yeah. they're they're the, the greatest to me bowie is the vin scully of, yeah. of music. And the reason I say that is people talk about Vince Scully saying, not only is he the best we've ever seen, he's the best. There couldn't be anyone better than him. Yeah. And, and of course, Vince Scully has, has never changed over the years, whereas David Bowie has. And, and he's, he's when he died, 20 different people died, whether it was Ziggy yeah. Stardust or the Thin White Duke or Aladdin Sane or, yeah. or, his, or his 80s, the guy in the peach suit coming out <laughs> skanking while he's singing Modern Love. We've all seen the video. Yeah. You know, but he, he did. He had so many different styles mm-hmm. he started as a troubadour he goes to psychedelic rock glam garage you could say yeah he gets kind of euro pop ambient and he's, he becomes a new waver he goes back to hard rock he's done funk industrial his final album is like almost like you'd call it acid jazz yeah and and he you, you can't say he really perfected them all mm-hmm. but there was something for everybody there yeah and and you know you talk about uh, you talk about how it, it it wasn't for everyone. Everyone likes different styles. He I read a quote from him not long ago saying that he would go into an album knowing that the guy who bought his last album might not like this one and probably wouldn't. Right. And he didn't care. He's like, that's not why I'm doing it. And it's like you almost I don't think you can do that nowadays. It's oh, so no. tough to do that. No. Uh, unless you're Taylor Swift going from cowboy boots and a guitar to a dance pop record you know what I mean like, right yeah exactly. you almost can't do that and anymore. then and then Taylor Swift goes grunge in her next album and then goes to Zydeco I don't <laughs> know just, just like throwing, um, throwing something out yeah there. you know I mean you look at the great changes in 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 music history um uh the Beatles being one of them or sure. you know even uh I look at Paul Simon going into Graceland uh, and that's okay. one of the great changes but yeah Bowie, right. Bowie did that almost every album I was reading yeah. the disco- discography today mm-hmm. Um, remembering when I was in radio when Earthling hit and um, right. putting it in going uh, expecting a Heroes or Under Pressure and not getting that and not liking it at first. And right. now I'm afraid of Americans and Little Wonder songs that I quite enjoy. Yeah. Um, yeah, in other words, uh, you weren't expecting 240 yeah, beats a and, minute. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, so – as I as I got older and matured as a music fan and just someone who just you know enough I'm going to like what I like like um, the moments that Bowie created and, and mm-hmm. you ask me like what are my favorite Bowie songs it's going to be a greatest hits collection because I'm not as deep as as someone like you or others sure um, but uh, as I ooh, knock over my whiskey here don't, um, don't do that um, but to the, this guy too was such a great songwriter mm. and he had great producers and, and and support along the way but he drove the writing of some amazing songs this guy could write a hook better than yeah. almost anyone in, in yep. music history yep. and i think of moments in songs um that with his voice which was one of the kind uh one of the mm-hmm. kinds the hooks of 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 songwriting are just amazing and that's what makes those songs uh, uh, permeate into some I mean they're trailer songs you know Suffragette City or Rebel Rebel are going to appear in right. trailers you know? oh <laughs> Let, sure Let's Dance yeah, uh, yeah. is a uh, used great and private parts Howard Stern's movie Let's Dance is <laughs> figure, you know right. a great song in the, I, I, you know so um well, well, that's why I'm kind of the Bowie fan that, that Bowie fans can't stand in that, like, yeah, uh, as, as far as like how I became a fan, I would love to be able to yeah. say that little five-year-old me was sitting in my living room in the 70s, mm-hmm. uh, playing with my Tonka toys and listening to Hunky Dory. I wasn't. Because right. my parents did not raise me on rock music. They played Top 40 radio. Sure. So you grow up and you hear changes. And you hear uh, mm-hmm. uh, Rebel Rebel. You hear Suffragette City. You yeah. hear, uh, you might even hear 1984, but but you hear Life on Mars. Uh, great songs. And, and I'm growing up listening to him going, I should 
get a good greatest hits of him someday. Sure. You know? And then the eighties hit and that's when I, I'm like a teenager and suddenly he, he consciously starts writing hits yeah. and the let's dance album explodes with blue. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, with let's dance and mm-hmm. modern love and mm-hmm. China girl, the three massively big hits. And I, I am sure that everybody who grew up with him in the seventies hated that album. And matter of fact, yeah. I think most people do. I mean, a lot of people if sure. you ask him, say nothing he put out after 1980 scary monsters was any good. Right. Oh, okay, fine. But that's the era that I grew up with. And yeah. the two albums that came after that, which were Tonight and Never Let Me Down, uh, even Bowie himself always ripped on those albums. He hated yeah. them. He wished he'd never recorded them. I loved them because that's what I grew up on. And at the, yeah. you know, and at the, at the time, I mean, that's just – this. Is, Bowie's awesome. <laughs> this, this is just great. And it wasn't only until later on, like the late 90s, mm-hmm. when I really started going back. I became more of a collector, more of a hoarder. <laughs> and, and you and I share that trait. It's yes. true. And if you yeah. see my CD collection, you know. And I, I realized, boy, you know, I really should go back and start getting some of his old stuff. And actually, uh, kind of how mm-hmm. the obsession grew was that all of his albums were out on, on a company called uh, Ryko had put yeah. out all of his albums on CD and then Virgin bought the rights in 99 and, and they started putting all the albums out without bonus tracks like the Ryko yeah. versions all had two to four bonus tracks gotcha. and the right the virgins were remastered but they didn't have those songs and you got to remember in the 90s before iTunes or even Napster or anything else if you couldn't get the song on CD and it went out of print it was gone forever right so I went on a quest like I got to get all this Bowie before it disappears forever <laughs> yeah so I go into a store oh there's Aladdin saying there's um, a station to station okay I don't have these two yet and I, I, I bought like 12 Bowie albums in a week nice. because I just was suddenly obsessed and like now, now that I've got them well I should listen to them and yeah. I just went through and listened to them all like Man, this guy was good. Now I see what everyone's talking about. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, and then, and then that's it's so funny in this pop culture loving time. Uh, you know, uh, where, where pop culture is everything now, and geek is big, and nerd is big, and passions for these little things. Um, you know, it's like if you didn't like Bowie from the beginning, you don't get some cred or something. But you're going to find them when you're going to find them. You know, right. every generation refines the Beatles organically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know what you're thinking. Though it's like, look, I, I'm switching gears. Game of Thrones. Uh, I know it better uh, than anything anybody right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, or most people. But I, I, I found it through the TV show. Right. So I feel guilty. <laughs> I've read all the books. I have books of maps. I could tell you the history of Westeros better than the history of America at this point. And I'm a history buff. Mm. Um, so I always feel guilty. Like, I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't read this in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so and, I know what you're, yeah. you're probably like, I'm sorry, Let's Dance was my favorite song for a year. You know, like, right. you know I yes. apologize. I apo- yeah, all the, all the music's not fishy. And as a matter of fact, when you mentioned Game of Thrones, yeah. my first thought was to the TV show. Like, oh, yeah, there were books, weren't there? <laughs> yeah. I really- my, my friend uh, Paul always jokes, I made a book about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I know what you mean, but here, no apologies needed. When you find him, you find him, and yep, yep. and that's and because there's going to be through his death, I'm sure there's going to be an entire new group of people that go, "What was that about?" Yeah, and there already are. As yeah. we, uh, we we talked about this a little while ago, the mm-hmm. um, offline, of course, mm-hmm. was that Amazon. I just read a thing where they mm-hmm. sold out of Bowie CDs. Like Amazon.com yeah. has sold out of Bowie CDs. Black Star's new album is number one. It's going to debut at number one. It's going to yeah. debut at number one, and rightfully so. So I want to go again, and when I unfortunately break the news, but at the same time, I'd rather I'd be the one that lets you know. Yeah, well, uh, and, well, now I always associate you with that. So you, you know, in ancient civilizations, they could kill you. <laughs> I could, I could legally kill you for what you said to me, yeah, and, and no court would. And I would understand in this, well, in this yeah. thing. So, so right. when uh, I want to start getting into some of the essential Bowie here and the, the mm. albums you need, but when right. he when he. Unfortunately, passes away. Other than other than going and downloading his, his uh, or, or finally looking into Black Star, his new album, which I did that night too. I, I right. downloaded it immediately. I sure. hadn't purchased, it, but I, I had been looking at it two days mm. prior. Oh, that came out. Yeah. Let me tell. I'll, I'll get that and let me in a, let me wait for my next paycheck. You know, yeah. I immediately downloaded it and right. and, and Lazarus and, and Dollar Days and I can't give it away or Hunting, mm. but also we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Sure. Where did your mind musically? Where did your mind go first? And what was like the first song you wanted to hear? The first album you wanted to put in? Well, actually, the first album I wanted to hear was Black Star since I hadn't heard. Fair it. enough. Yeah, exactly. And then after that, I, I actually kind of partially in preparation for this, but part, mm. partially as just sort of ther- as a therapy thing, mm. I have been listening to his entire catalog. I started. The, at the, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not the very beginning started with uh, the album called David Bowie, which later yep. became Space Oddity. Right. The one with the title track and really very little else that would be famous. And I've just been listening to them in order and just soaking them all in. Wow. And, you know, and we talked about all the genres, too, and, and all the ones he went through. It, 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 it's really you're going to be hard pressed to find any fan who likes 
every single thing he ever put out. And mm-hmm. that and that's part of his brilliance. I mean, he put out 28 albums. But, yeah. but because there were so many different styles, anybody who says they like every single thing he ever put out is probably lying or is uh, related to him. It's just <laughs> it's just not going to be the way. Again, I go back to the fact that he wasn't as all, always successful as you'd hope a, a, a rock legend to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. We all want to go. I mean, I was fortunate you took me to see mm. him on his final, what ended up being his final tour. Right. Um, and he, tour. it was a two and a half hour greatest hits show. Mm. with the new stuff put in right um and i'm so glad i got to see him at that time because you were telling your first experience wasn't the same when you saw bowie it was not the same i saw him in 95 i believe it was on the Mm. tour with nine inch nails Mm. and it was right around that time that bowie had said because he was constantly changing and he had said right around that time that my old stuff is my old stuff and i'm done i'm retiring it Mm -hmm. i I don't want to be known as a vegas lounge act for the rest of my life so when i'm going on tour and you're gonna be hearing my new stuff and if you don't like it, then don't come, yeah. <laughs> basically, in a nutshell. And uh, that's pretty much what it was. Uh, Nine Inch Nails opened for Bowie, and he came out, and he was playing uh, stuff from his album outside, a lot right. of stuff, which I ap- love that album now. At the time, I wasn't as crazy about it. He played one song that you would have recognized, which was called, uh, which was The Man Who Sold the World. Yeah. But even that was like a very technified version Different of it. Version, it, it, yeah. it looks like it sounded like it belonged on the Earthling album, which was yeah. kind of his techno album, for lack of a better word. Right, right, right. Uh, and that was the only thing you would have recognized. So it was a, it was a good show it was interesting it's just it, if you were going to see a bowie concert that's not the one you would have picked right because it was very again not as accessible as you would want not as accessible yeah. as you would want it's true i'm fortunate that uh feel very fortunate i got to see him uh, on a show where i could uh, uh for the first time really be hit with the the weight of his cannon in my face and how much like <laughs> oh yeah i i do love him more than i knew being a radio DJ that couldn't always uh, find a good song to connect with uh, Ashes to Ashes. You know what I mean? Sure. It was really yeah. hard to play other than the four or five biggest hits. You couldn't yeah. really... We, I worked at a radio station that we were allowed to, but mm-hmm. it's like when you're building... There's an art to building a set of songs, and, and mm-hmm. it's hard to connect something to Bowie. It's hard. It is. Because he's yeah. so different. Right. He's so who he, who he is. And, and so that show was the one that made me go, oh... All together by himself, this was an amazing journey. Yeah, and, and because he had had 40 years, I guess, under, or more, 45 years mm-hmm. probably of music under his belt. And he even had time it's to crazy. kind of, yeah, he even had time to kind of redo some of his stuff. Like uh, we talked about uh, the Tonight album, which most people categorically hate, came out in 1985. 84. And, and, uh, okay. 84. The, October it, it, of 84. Uh, October of 84. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I just re- remembered more from 85. But um, even Bowie himself hated that album, distanced right. himself from it. But he played a song from it called loving the alien which i love the album version right. but bowie uh, in concert i don't know if you remember this but it's on the dvd where he talks about how this is kind of how i feel that this song should have come out and it was it, it on the album it was much more of a grandiose big seven minute long mm-hmm. pop hit when he played it live it was mostly just piano and guitar and it mm. was a very moody song Interesting, especially when it's played that way. And yeah, he came out and said, "Yeah, I kind of wish I had recorded it like this." So he was able to take even some of the stuff from his back catalog and mess around with it and make it kind of like this is this is how I like it now. He, mm-hmm. he was George Lucas at that time. <laughs> oh, did I? <laughs> okay. Did I say that? Yeah, it's oh, okay, man. So let's get into essential Bowie, man. Uh, you're you're the guide on this little adventure and this little tour right. we're gonna take today. Um, and I know there's people out there listening who are giant Bowie fans, and they're gonna have their own thoughts and opinions, but they're probably curious to hear yours and now there's some people out there who are probably just about to discover for themselves how great this uh, rock legend was and this is who this list is geared towards because i I would i I have my 10 albums that Mm -hmm. i that i love and my 10 songs that i love and actually when i say my 10 albums that i love these would not be the 10 best bowie albums sure if you want to take that you're probably taking most of his stuff from the 70s and throwing a couple things in there too matter of fact i just went to a website i forgot the name of it where they ranked i'm sure there are a hundred sites that have done this but ranked the bowie albums 28 down to one yeah. as far as the best ones and uh, this one particular website had uh, out of the top 14 albums 12 of them were, were recorded in the 70s or in 1980 Gotcha. So and like they had a couple other things. Yeah. I think Black Star was thrown in there too. So I mean, really the seventies. He put eleven albums out in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, I'm looking at it. And the work rate of, of of rock bands and artists back then was a lot different than it is now. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, uh, right. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that now. I mean, seventy to seventy nine. 
and then you throw in 80 scary monsters and super creeps. Right. I mean, he's that's a lot. He's working. That is a lot. And that's part of why there'll never be another Bowie is because yeah. he was so prolific. I yeah. mean, he put out 20 ad albums total if you include the two he did with his band Tin Machine. Yeah. But like, I, I, I kind of looked at some of the other popular artists these days, like Coldplay has been around since sure. 2000. They have seven albums. Right. In order to put out 28, they'll need to record until they're dead. And they're talking about being done. And, so. they're, and they're talking about being done. <laughs> right. And, and you know, like uh, Taylor Swift, I think she has mm-hmm. four or five albums. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 people just don't put albums out that much anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, going back, going back to my list of All 10. Right. So here we are. Are we counting down 10 to 1? Uh, in this respect, no. In okay. this respect, I'm going cr- chronologically. Perfect. Because, okay. So yeah. there's no real – so this is the 10 essential and you out there – can find your one. Yeah, and the reason I call them the 10 essential is is if you have these 10, you've pretty much got a pretty broad slice of everything he's done for the most part. Okay, I uh, like that. Like like Earthling was his one techno album I didn't include it, but that's just because I thought it was good, but not one of my 10 best. But anyway, starting in 1971, you got Hunky Dory, which many people consider probably his best ever. Okay. Uh, that and Ziggy Stardust, which, uh, okay, I'll talk about those together because they were 71, 72. And Hunky Dory's got Life on Mars. It's got mm-hmm. Changes, Oh You Pretty Things, Quicksand, uh, uh, Kooks, another popular song, the Bule Brothers. I mean, th- that really was probably what okay. most people consider his best. And Ziggy Stardust, which came out, um, oh, I actually should should mention some while I'm talking about these two together and talking about the Bowie chameleon effect. Um, there was a great Bowie documentary called uh, Five Years. The BBC did it, but it, it aired on uh, on US, okay, yeah. on US I think, stations. I think, and then I think there was a, 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 a CD release with that. I saw. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. There, there may there may yeah. actually have been, but yeah, this was just an hour long documentary, just chronicling five different years in Bowie's life, not consecutive years. It wasn't like seventy two to seventy six, but it was like. 71, 72, and then 74, 75, that kind of thing. Fascinating. Anyway, they, but but the producer, he had put out Hunky Dory, which had a lot of, you know, uh, piano stuff, a little bit. It, it had its rockers, too. But, I mean, if you think Changes was a, was a pretty mellow song, and, mm-hmm. and um, um, Life on Mars was orchestral and beautiful. And his producer said that, that Bowie told him, I've, I've written the songs for the new album. And the producer was like, great. And he's like, yeah, you're not going to like them. <laughs> because that became Ziggy Stardust, which was his big... Glam, wham, yeah. thank you, ma'am. Album Suffragette City and Ziggy Stardust and uh, Moon Age Daydream. And Moon Age Daydream, yeah. But you still got Five Years and mm-hmm. Starman, which which could have belonged on on Hunky Dory. They probably could have right. could have belonged on there too. So I, I think those are the two. Those are two of like the ones okay. people say are probably the best of all time. I would throw in Young Americans from 1975. That was his okay. Phil, his Philly Soul album, and that had the title track Young Americans and had fame. Uh, yeah, fame. Plastic Soul, man. Plastic Soul. Yeah, it was very blue eyed soul. Uh, it, it, it was. I just I just loved it. He that was his, yeah. really his one kind of blue eyed soul album, and it was great. I love Young Americans. We used to play that at KBR ninety five. And Young Americans, I just I just always loved the line. Do you remember your the President, President Nixon? Nixon? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I no, love he was, that little line. Yeah. Was so he was fun. he was very into like the uh, the, yeah. the Philadelphia soul uh, um, part yeah, of the time. Yeah. yeah at the time. And uh, I'm looking at every every time you mention these albums, I'm bringing them up so I can look at myself here. Right. I had Luth- Luther Vandross getting a co-writing credit on Fascination. I, I didn't I, know that. I meant to mention that, and actually, yeah. it, uh, that's in the documentary too. Was okay. was one of the there's a song called Right that mm-hmm. they did, which is actually one of my absolute favorites of Bowie, even though it's 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 really nothing real special. It's just sure. one of those ones I love it. And the background singer was talking about how difficult it was to record, and and they show Luther Vandross in yeah. the in the uh, documentary, and all the background singers having to play off of each other and all that. But yeah. That was a young young Luther Vandross on that album, so that would be my third one. My fourth one would be a station. It would be a. Should I wait for you to catch? Well, up? no, I just sorry <laughs> things are things are popping up. Uh, fame is one of my favorite David Bowie songs, right. but actually more specifically, Fame ninety. Uh, uh, and okay, weird little thing about me. Uh, in during high school and college, my friends and I had a uh, professional wrestling company that we ran in our front yard, which was one of those things. And the, the backyard wrestling is different now than it was then. This was us having fun right. characters. We filmed it for video production. Uh, so I had a character, and my, my theme song was Fame 90, which is oh, right. technically for the Pretty Woman soundtrack is where I got <laughs> I, I it from. I think you're right, yeah. uh, But I love Fame, co-written by yep. John uh, Lennon and uh, Carlos Alomar, but, uh, and Lennon's on it doing the backing vocals. Mm-hmm. And I just love that song, man, and it's yeah. so weird, and, but it's, it's got some really, those lyrics uh, uh, struck me about, uh, about fame. Yeah. I love it. And, and the song was more funk, really, than yeah. soul. But, yeah. but, it, but somehow it fit. It just fit. It would have it fit on several other albums, but it also mm-hmm. it's the last song on the album, and it fits right in there, too. Uh, then 
then you go straight from Philly Soul into heavily coked out Bowie with Station to Station. And at, right. at, when I say that, I mean he he he, ver- he remembers very little about the recording of that album. He, right. he basically has said, "Yeah, it sounds like it was you know it, it's like it was done with somebody else." Right. But it's but it's brilliant. I mean, it's got the title track Station to Station, uh, what else? Golden Years, another one called TVC One like Five, uh, uh, Wild as the Wind. I mean, it's only got six songs on it because Station to Station is ten minutes long. I was gonna say yes. Yeah, so looking at it now, uh, six songs. That's uh you know, that's fascinating yeah. in itself there. Yeah, well, each one was a kind of a minimum of like five to six uh-huh. minutes. And Station to Station was about a 10 or 11 minute song right there. Well, <laughs> that's a sign. If you're if you're a rock star and you're releasing about a 10, 11 minute song, uh, you're doing a lot of coke. Uh, and that's what Noel Gallagher himself said about uh, Be Here Now, <laughs> the, be, uh, Oasis, the third Oasis album. Right. Every song, the lo- shortest song was like six minutes. Yep. Like, that was the coke talking. <laughs> Which is strange because you would think coke would make things speed up. <laughs> I would think every song would be like a minute 45. Every song would be like blurred you know a song too mm-hmm. Woo-hoo. Uh, yeah. um so okay <laughs> so so that station one, to station yep so that'd be my add what? that to the list yep, kids. add it to the list uh heroes okay heroes i uh, you, you gotta add heroes i i you know unlike you i actually have not overly crazy about the title song okay it is it is widely considered one explain of his more very, it's widely considered one of his best and i don't know i uh, it, it it's a good song but it just mm. didn't quite didn't, didn't catch it. Didn't quite catch me. Yeah, it goes on for about six minutes. I felt it could have run about 3.30. I don't know. Well, but there's the single version. You can get into the single version. And I do. And me, I love it. Exactly. <laughs> three and a half minutes, yeah. three chords and the truth, kids. Um, <laughs> Actually, the single I have is, is, you know, three minutes on one side and three minutes on the other. So you uh, can listen to it. Well, no. I have uh, back back <laughs> in my radio days, which I'm going to be referring to often here, kids, so don't be uh, tired of it. But uh, when I would, uh, I'd have a couple options with Heroes. If I knew I needed a bathroom run, I'd put in the six minute version. Oh, if, I, if I knew I want to just get in and out. It was a, it was a single version. I, some D, I think it was Mark and Ryan used to joke about playing the Stairway to Heaven Freebird medley. You know what? When, when they needed a, when they needed. A if I played or, anything yeah. from Rush, uh, I was going to get food. <laughs> uh, and maybe something else. <laughs> and maybe something else. All right. Um, so. Just from my perspective as a as a greatest hits Bowie fan, uh, so yeah, you got heroes. Obviously, I, I'm calling that one of my all time favorites of Bowie. Okay. Uh, you be damned, Jay. But I'm looking right. at this album. There's nothing else that jumps off me as a casual fan. I'm like, oh, I I don't know these songs. So what other what other things behind heroes should I be looking for? Here? Well, to be honest, what you should be looking for is some of the more ambient ambient rock stuff on side two songs like sense of doubt and moss garden that like okay. largely instrumental if not entirely instrumental but uh heroes was part of the bowie berlin trilogy it was it was with low, eno right it, with with uh eno exactly with uh low and lodger and heroes were the three and here and they all had their sort of ambient stuff there's a great song called uh warzawa which is off the um it's off the low album, I believe. Uh, that's that's just a, a really moody, brooding track, complete, pretty much completely instrumental. But I, I love that stuff. That's what he kind of seemed to do, really, with those albums. Mm-hmm. He, was, he, had, he had his half rock stuff and half sort of sort of uh, and it, well, more avant-garde Yeah, and stuff. it would make sense that you're working with Brian Eno on that stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep, the Lambians yep. coming in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Brian Eno's another guy I feel like I should I – should, dig into more because he's he's got some pretty yeah stuff no right absolutely there. i don't know much roxy about music um you know more than this is one of the great rock singles of mm-hmm. all time i think uh i would definitely um i love the song but then lost in translation just drove it into my soul but uh, <laughs> and, that, and that's and again that's what happens with music i don't it, feel it i don't worry that i didn't get into uh a, that song until 2004 right. i don't worry because then it hit me at the right time when i needed it and so that's the thing about being a music fan i uh, i you and i are similar and i mm-hmm. i face in my in my old age um but when you and i first really connected as friends first over fantasy baseball then over mm-hmm. simpsons and then over talking about music ad nauseum i felt i needed to know every song every album from every artist released yes i, I had subscriptions <laughs> to q magazine and i felt i and then after a while just i uh, not to get weird and spiritual man but the songs are gonna find you and they and, are and um you know with you know i think that's the case too but uh uh, same with same with Bowie. Yep, and and you know it, it's funny too because going back to the podcast we recorded before, our yeah. ten albums we need to live, our ten songs we need to live. I don't think I mentioned the words David Bowie on either of those podcasts once, and I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself now. But but maybe it's just because I, I don't know, like none of the Bowie albums. Maybe it's because all of his albums, I love them so much right. that it's hard to. It, it's almost like picking your favorite child, I guess. It, it's mm-hmm. it's hard to pick one album that I would include in my top ten. I guess I would say Hunky Dory probably. Sure, but I mean I have other albums that that speak to me, but. But, of course, that's an ever-changing list. So I, I'm going to retroactively put Hunky Dory in there and throw off some crazy crap by some other <laughs> artist nobody cares about. 
Fair just enough. to be one of the cool kids. Yeah. Because that's, you know. I've I'm, always wanted to be cool, man. Uh, always. Um, speaking of being cool or, or not being cool, the mm-hmm. next one on the list, this is the one that, that the knives are going to come out. I had to pick something from the 80s period of Bowie. Okay. And I had to pick the one that is commonly, this isn't even a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. This is his worst album. Okay. <laughs> this is, it's hard, it's hard to say that as a matter of fact, it's called Never Let Me Down. It, it's, it's not a great album, especially if you were raised on 70s stuff. Sure. It's, a, it's not a great album. I love it. it, it it's what I was brought up on. It's what I was brought up on. It, uh, title track was a single, uh, Time Will Crawl was another song from it. it. It's all kind of stadium arena rock pop, but it's, it, it's, it's not great. It's not right. art. Man, there's even one song on there called Too Dizzy, which Bowie yeah. himself apparently hated so much. He had it left off of future releases of the album. When it got re-released, right. that Too Dizzy just mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> and I believe it's, be, I haven't confirmed it, but I believe it's because he just hated it hated so it. much. He's, yeah, he's like, I'm surprised. I'm reading a quote from Bowie about Never Let Me Down right oh, now. It yeah. says, now I listen to Never Let Me Down. I wish I had been uh, less indifferent to its production because there were some good songs on it. But I let it, but I let go and it became very soft musically, which wasn't the way I would have done it if I had been more involved. Now, that's interesting because it wasn't so much soft. I mean, there's actually not a quiet track. on the mm. whole. There's, There are no ballads on the entire album. It's all pretty much upbeat stuff. What Bowie said about that album and the Tonight album was that mm. those were pretty much, and I think actually Let's Dance may have been the same thing in that he didn't play a single instrument on any of those records. Sure. Um, he basically wrote the songs, arranged them, gave it to musicians and said, here you guys go. Um, right. He, he was like Krusty the Clown uh, coming in to do his voiceovers. You know, <laughs> Buy my cereal. All right, I'm out of here. Learn from a professional kid. I mean, that was pretty much it. He, w- yeah. he would come into his vocals and bail. That was pr- pretty much all he did. <laughs> all he did yeah. for, for those albums. So he, he kind of wished he had been more hands on. I've also heard him say he wished he had never recorded them because he was not into music at that time. Well, so. yeah. Hey, I think you're allowed to go into some phases there. Yeah. You know? But you're right. I think now an artist might stop and not record because, but, you know, unless you don't have the ability to, if you got to make your career move forward. But yeah, yeah. It, it's like, it, it's, a, you know, you and I were talking, like, what if the Beatles had kept going? Like, I'm yeah. sure there would have been some drivel that oh. came out at some point. Yeah. The, I, mean, I mean, the question is, would it have been more like, you, you just like starting over? Or would it have been more like, got my mind set on you? Yeah. I mean, it's very possible that they would have put out some pop songs that. Yeah. That class and people would have said, oh, man, current Beatles sucks compared yeah. to the 60s. Yeah. You know, Bowie wasn't the only guy to, to do that in the 80s to cash in. I mean, the other guy that co- pops into my head is Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Right. Bruce Springsteen, you know, with, with The River, Born to Run and all that. Those were pretty highly lauded albums. And then he puts out Born in the USA, which, while a good album, has seven top 10 singles on it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, everybody is skanking along to Courtney Cox in, in, the, in the video <laughs> with Dancing in the Dark, which is a very heavy synth. Yeah, pop tune, and I, I I'm not a big Springsteen guy, so I don't I don't know too many big Springsteen people. But I do, I, I, I do. I, oh, do you? I, I am sure they all hate that album. It's yeah, not, it, not knowing my, by and large. Yeah, everyone think. has that weird uh, relationship with your favorite artist's biggest hits. Yeah, you know, again, yeah. look, you and heroes, but but right, uh, yeah, right. absolutely. And again, hey, look at the Stones, man. Mm-hmm. The Stones. I always hear sometimes, uh, you know, like if you love the Stones better than Beatles, that's great. You, that battle's been being fought since the early '60s. But um, <laughs> uh, you know, they went through some periods where like it might have been better if they didn't go through the period. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know? we're just gonna. It happens. It happens, <laughs> yeah. man. They're, they're human beings. But all right, so so. Going to never, and I'm, I'm looking right now at uh, at uh, Let's Dance, uh, the album in whole, and um, uh, I, I think maybe part of the reason I didn't include Let's Dance is because yeah. those three songs that were such singles. I, I'm pretty much sick of them all now. I, gotcha. I, I I don't need to hear those songs anymore and because those, they those were being Let's Dance, China Girl, Modern Love. Exactly, gotcha. they were so overplayed on the you know played yeah. and played and played to death that yeah. I, don't, I don't really need to hear them anymore. Well, one of my favorites on there that that came to me late was Cat People putting out fire. And actually, and, and this is one you and I may differ. I don't know if you're aware there were two different versions of it. I, uh, I don't. I'm only familiar with the yeah with one version then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the one version that I love actually of Cat mm-hmm. People was the one from the soundtrack of Cat People, which, where, is, which is a movie by it, the way, kids. It, it, it is a movie. Ask your parents, and it it starts out very slow and brooding and just kind of a ch- so it's yeah. a, a very slow rhythm. He's, just, see these. he's singing like that. Okay. Uh, it's so blue. Blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's singing um, like that. That's the version I have. That's, yeah. that's, okay. that's the version. And, and I happen to love that version. This version uh, doesn't have that. It basically is just a, a more rock, raw gotcha. version okay. of it. Which, which this is why I say, since I have more pop sensibilities, you have more rock sensibilities, mm. I would guess you would like that version more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look it up. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, but, um, you know, but you know where I discovered that song? Uh, hmm. Again, late in the game, right? Uh, songs find you when you want them. Um, is uh, the use of it in, in Glorious Bastards? 
Oh, okay. Because yeah. the juxtaposition of this period fa- fantasy World War II movie um, and this David Bowie song just stood out in this amazing <laughs> way. And, and t- I talk about Bowie's moments and the moments he could create as a songwriter and the hooks. Um, but vocally, when he hits that, I'm um, putting out fire with gasoline and he hits that one gasoline that Gans- just drops. Yeah. Gasoline. You know, you're right. One of the greatest mo- vocal moments, I think, in, in rock music history for, for, for my money. Yeah, Bowie, part of a great piece of revisionist history there, that movie. Mm-hmm. For, for sure. <laughs> Bowie's whole career, I guess, was revisionist history, but uh, yeah, yeah, that but, movie particularly. Um, mm-hmm. But again, again, it's one of those things where I, I, I don't own the Last, last Dance album yet. Um, yeah. But uh, so I wasn't, uh, I'd heard the song, you know, so yeah. as, as a DJ again, I, things filtered in my brain. But like in the movie, I was just like, what am I, what am I experiencing? Yeah. And again, that's, some strength of Tarantino, but again, great song. Yeah, it, yep, it it really is. Um, and speaking of, of uh, movie or movie, speaking of soundtrack songs, this is one that almost nobody is familiar with. Um, mm-hmm. Is an album called The Buddha of Suburbia. Is when it came out in 1993, and it's one of those really unfortunate things where I guess it was originally kind of written as ambient music for a mm-hmm. BBC t- a TV show, I think a miniseries. Um, right. I guarantee almost nobody who isn't a Bowie fan knows this album even exists. I didn't know it existed probably until around. I don't know, mm-hmm. like 2005, maybe. I was in a record store and I'm like, what is the Buddha of Suburbia? <laughs> Honestly, I had never heard of it. it. I don't think it ever officially even got released in the States. It's sort of a mix of, the, the title track is phenomenal, but a lot of the other stuff is sort of a mix of, uh, God, what would you call it? Uh, it, it was it was recorded very quickly. It was recorded in less than a week, yeah. and I guess mixed in another week. But it, it's got some it's got some of the tech some of the, not so much techno from Earthling. Uh, I'm I'm waffling because it, it's kind of an indescribable album. But it, it's got some yeah. ambient music, and it's it's got it's got a, kind of a little bit of everything. The ambient instrumentals, yeah, it's yeah. all over the place. Yeah, it's a song called Sex in the Church, which is a uh, a, a swingy song written in six eight, as you would imagine a song called Sex in the Church would be <laughs> naturally yeah, as, as you do. Uh, it, but it's it's and it, it's a great song too. Yeah. But uh, just the whole album, start to finish, is, uh, is a Bowie winner. himself says the album itself only got one review, a good one, as it happens, yeah. and it is virtually non-existent as far as my catalog goes. It was designated a soundtrack. It got zilch in the way of marketing money. A, that, real, a real shame. That is the absolute truth. Yeah. It, it as a matter of fact, if you go to Wikipedia, it doesn't even list that album in its discography. You it have does to, now. It does. Oh, it does now. It does now. That's, okay. That's where I'm looking at it. Oh, okay. Because well, it it might list it, but it lists it under soundtracks, right? Or does no, it, no studio albums. Oh, doesn't no kidding. It might have been updated. Uh, it, it might have just been. Yeah, updated. you got yeah. Black Tie, White Noise, nineteen ninety three, and the Boot of Suburbia, nineteen ninety three, uh, in studio albums. Yeah. Okay, because because the last time I checked, it went from Black Tie, White Noise yeah, which, to to outside. Seven. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it was. Mm-hmm. I think outside would have been next, right? Uh, it must have been next because outside would be the next album I would yeah. put on there. And uh, outside, it is a true concept album, and the full name of it. Oh gosh, I, I had it somewhere. Uh, maybe you can maybe you can look that one up real quick and tell me the full, um, the full name of the album. The, it's, it's, uh, oh gosh, um, <laughs> sorry sorry to put you on the spot. Like no, this. it's subtitled "The Ritual Art Murder of Baby Grace Blue: uh, A Nonlinear Gothic Drama Hypercycle." That's it. Yeah, and it sounds better coming out of your Ooh. mouth anyway. Right, exactly. It's a pure concept album. It's got like your your spoken word um, interludes. Yeah, uh, there, there's probably not. You talk about more hooks than a tackle box, right? From a mm-hmm. good song, probably not a whole, not a hook on this entire album. Right, uh, right. Really, and I remember the heart's filthy lesson was a, a, a single at the time that I. I played yeah. on the radio. And yeah. it, it was kind of a single by default. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not a pop song. No, it's, it's, no, it's no. Not, oh, we day parted so that goodness. late into the evening. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, there were a couple singles. It was that one and uh, um, Outside, which was the, like the title track. They're not pop songs, but the right. album start to finish, it, it has a little bit of everything too. It's It's got, mm-hmm. uh, again, the spoken word instrumentals, it, it's got mood music, but it, it's... Um, they're great songs. It, it has a little Nine Inch Nails to it because that's about when he went on tour well, with them. Time, yeah. It's got some industrial, like a song called Hello Space Boy, which mm-hmm. actually was a single too. That's very industrially kind of sounding. Right. Fantastic. Well, I've only really got two left, which yeah, it, hit it, me. It, it's, hit it's me, kind hit. of the shame of his outside came out in 95 and here it is 2016 and I've got like two albums from the list mm-hmm. because he just didn't put out nearly as much in the later years. Uh, Heathen from, okay. from from 2012. Yeah. With, uh, or 2000. Did I say two, did I say twenty twelve? Yeah, you, yeah you, you added a one. I I did. It, it's true. It, it just feels. And I like, like Ethan. It feels like a twenty twelve. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I like I like Ethan. When, when it comes down to it. yeah, five fifteen angels have gone. I yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Slow, yep. slow burn, slip away, which mm-hmm. is you know one of, one of my absolute favorite songs is, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I'll just finish out the last album. I had to throw in Black Star. 
I, I did. It, it's, that's not a um, emotional reaction pick. That's a it's not no. damn fine album. It, it is. And talk about saving some of your best for last. Mm-hmm. And and we'll we talk were, about it. Yeah, yep. let's talk about that. Cause, oh yeah. Whew, and it's uh, it, just listening to it. It's so clear. It's a mm, it's a goodbye. Right. Um, as 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 what you listened to it on the night he died first. Uh, yep. I mean, take me through that. Oh wow. Well, of course, I had heard Black Star, and I had heard uh, I had heard Tis a Bitty, She Was a Whore. That's the second yeah. the second song. Um, yeah, and just just listening to all the songs, it, it really is an album. And for, I, I really wish I had listened to it before he died, because mm-hmm. as we said, it's an album that meant a lot different thing. It meant it meant a much different thing on Monday. After we heard, sure. the, or in our case, Sunday when we had the news broken to us, then it did on Friday when it was released. Right, it meant an entirely different thing. All of a sudden, we realized this is Bowie saying farewell. Yeah, and and getting to those last two songs, Dollar Days, and I can't give everything away, and and mm-hmm. you just relate it to him knowing this is how I'm going out. Yeah, you hear it. Of course, uh, Lazarus Lazarus mm-hmm. is getting all the press right now because of the video uh, um, and what it clearly uh, implies and means and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think uh, in the album from start to finish is, is fascinating. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it and you're waiting to get into it, go in, dive, turn the lights down low, put the headphones in. Mm-hmm. But it closes with Dollar Days and I Can't Give Everything Away. And, and it just, it's, um, it, it's tough. I know some people, friends of mine who are Bowie fans who couldn't get through it yet. Wow, or can't get through it yet. Mm, um, all right. Understandable. Yeah. Um, for me, and I, I want to get more from you on the album, but um, as a George Harrison fan, we knew what was coming. Mm. Uh, Harrison was sick and throat cancer had come in, and we knew one album was was coming out. Brainwash was his last album, and and right. it was done very typical George, uh, you know. And it was a it was it was an acoustic jangly guitar and some spiritual stuff, and there's some great songs on there, and it was a great send off for George. Right. Um, but um, this is different. This is someone who, uh, a true artist to the end. Mm. Uh, I think no one in the, and it's, it's, it's tragic as it goes, but there's no one in the history of, of rock music or, or pop culture that has gone out on his shield like David Bowie did. Absolutely, yeah. Um, to know it was coming, to keep it secret, to even some, apparently some of his even closest <laughs> friends. Right. Um, and, 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 and produce this and to, and unfortunately to go out this way but it is a it is it is if you're going to do it yeah this is the way to this go this is how you do it <laughs> but bowie never failed a surprise and this is even yeah, going back to 19 an artist to the end man he was and even going back to 1973 i think one of my favorite uh, things it was the uh the, the last uh concert that uh ziggy stardust the, mm-hmm. the last ziggy w- with the, the band with the spiders from mars when yeah. uh, uh, it's been it's been written about this a million times where he comes out and tells the audience at the end of the show thank you this is one of our favorite shows i uh, and especially because it's the last show we'll ever do which came as a shock to everybody, apparently including some of the band members. They didn't know. I mean, I guess a couple of them did and a couple it of them didn't. didn't. Yeah. Can you imagine just being on, on stage thinking, oh, what a great tour. I can't wait to do it again in six months. And like, I'm, well, huh? We're not, we're not. And it's true. The next time he toured was on the uh, Diamond Dogs album. And yeah. I guess he had an entirely different band. He had a, like 100% different band at that time. But, you know, toward, toward the end of his career. Mm-hmm. You've got uh, uh, the next day, which came out in I think it was uh, 2012, and he he basically hadn't put anything out for 10 years. Yeah, and all of a sudden it's here's Bowie's new single, and his next album's coming out next month. And yeah, it, to, to everybody's surprise, with Black Star it was the same thing. It was Bowie's new single debuts today, and his album's coming out on his birthday, January 8th. It, really? Like nobody had yeah. any clue, and all of a sudden here's his new single. And I remember, gosh, I was in England, and I I downloaded it on iTunes, just put it in my iPod. I had a 20 minute walk to the train station mm-hmm. to go home from work, and I had time to listen to the song twice because it is a 10 minute long song, mm-hmm. and just just boy, blown away by how yeah. good this song was, and not even knowing this was going to be the last this thing it. Yeah. that we'd ever get. Just knowing it was his 69th birthday was when the album was coming out, and yeah. he, he's not going to be doing this forever. But boy, uh, the, the the song itself, which takes up about twenty five percent of the actual time of the album, yeah, and really kind of is isn't like any. A lot of the album is is very jazzy. It was it's mm-hmm. been well written. He he wrote with a sort of a jazz, not not really a jazz combo, but like some musicians, and they were just throwing all kinds of stuff at the wall, seeing what stuck. Right. He was he was inspired by I guess Kendrick Lamar, who I'm not overly familiar with, but he's like a rapper. rap artist. He's a rapper. The who, kids like him. Yeah, the kid, they, those crazy kids with mm-hmm. their Kendrick Lamar and their MySpace. They uh, he. Uh, yeah, I guess he's a rapper who threw like a lot of jazz elements. And mm-hmm. they said we were listening to a lot of him. We didn't put any rap on the album, but we but we put a lot of that el- yeah. those elements on that album. 
And uh, yeah, it supposedly, supposedly he even had five more songs that he had written and, and demoed. Did you read about this? I've read about that yeah. just today uh, in preparation for this. Uh, I, I think it was either uh, Tony Visconti or, or Eno. I, I, I think yeah. it was Visconti. That would make sense it was him. He produced his album. So right. saying that, yeah, but not not for this album, but for the next. For maybe a next one. Like He, he thought he had some more time. Indicating, yeah, yeah, he had a few months left, he thought, so, mm-hmm. which, which is... Which is Tragic in a way. Uh, it, yeah, who knows what he had cooked so. up? I'm sure we'll hear those. I, I'm, I'm sure the Black Star Deluxe version will come yeah. out in six months, and I will be the first guy to buy it again mm-hmm. when it has all those mm-hmm. great bonus tracks on them, which unfortunately will probably just be in demo form. I can't imagine we're going to get, uh, unless there was. I, I originally heard that there were five more songs from the Black Star Sessions that just didn't make the album. Gotcha. Uh, oh. But now I, I'm guessing that it's actually just the five demos. Uh, five demos, did. or hey, maybe we get a 10, 10, 10 thing. Um, Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, but mm. you know what? I tell uh, 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 sometimes, though, those uh, those little acoustic demos uh, that are not meant to be heard yet have the core of songs uh, buried in them, and I'm, uh, could be a, a great in a different way. So uh, I'd love to hear some of his uh, the versions of, of Black Star, uh, the songs on this album, uh, as he built them. Right, I'm sure they're. And sometimes those demos should have remained as as demos, and in, in that they should have been re- released as they were. Yeah, and maybe they were overproduced. Yeah, but, yeah. Mm. I, I just asked McCartney about Long and Winding Road, but um, oh, oh no, that's a, that's a story I'm not familiar. Well, with. with Phil Spector turned it into oh. uh, what it was, but that's why during the anthology, uh, finally McCartney got to release his true version of Long and Winding Road, which is huh. I think infinitely better because <laughs> it's just a simple, straight to the point. Uh, and McCartney at his best, where oh. Spector is great. Right, and a legend for what he did, wall of sound and everything. But I think it, it transformed it into something that, hearing the other version, you go back to Spectre's version and go, oh, that's a little smaltzy. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's fascinating to me. And I don't think I'd have that with Bowie. I'd love to hear an acoustic version of I Can't Give Everything Away. Mm. Um, oh, that would be haunting even more than this version. Is yeah, it? I'm really hoping they drag a lot of stuff out of the vaults. Um, uh, talking about the Outside album, which I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, uh, I heard a quote from Eno not long ago where he said, uh, where Bowie said that they had done about 20 hours of recording, and this was all in the span of about a week. Right. They recorded about 20 hours worth of stuff, and and they were there was all kinds of talk. Uh, Eno had said they had just talked recently about revisiting the sessions from that album, and and the thing with Outside was it was supposed to be the first chapter in a in a I guess a group of five albums that took you to, toward the millenniums. Outside right. came out in 93. It was very like millennial, millennial bluesy sort of a millenni- right. millennial uh, uh, angst, I guess, if you will. And so it, the actual name of the album is like one outside, like one period, like, like it's yeah. the first one on the list. Yeah. So we never did get two, three, four, or five. And it would have just been great to... It, it, it's too bad that they, mm-hmm. they never got around to doing any of that because yeah. that would have just been fascinating to hear because Outside was such a great album. Yeah. I mean, there is a big story behind that album, but it, there's no point in, in looking it up because it, it's not a complete story. We, we never find out what happened to Baby Grace. Eh, whatever, so whatever the so those is. are the, the 10 essential, but list them again just in order so people out right. there can, can go through this list. That if you are looking to get into Bowie <laughs> and you want the journey through a pretty daunting discography to go through, here is where your journey starts. And again, not the 10 best, but the 10 I would pick to, yeah. go, to go to my desert island with. Uh, Hunky Dory from 71, uh, Ziggy Stardust from 72, also called The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, uh, Young Americans from 75, Station to Station from 76, Heroes from 77, uh, Never Let Me Down from 87. <laughs> again, <laughs> give it a try. Give, give it a try. I mean, Bowie hates it, and so you should too, but I don't, and I don't care. Uh, the Boot of Suburbia, seek that one out from 93. Uh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, outside from 1995. Heathen from 2002, just because that, that he's, Bowie's mm-hmm. getting more backs just into, into straightforward rock stuff. Yeah. And Black Star, which the whole world apparently owns already. So As they should. As they as should. They should. Yeah. yeah, I actually, you know, you know, I told you I love... Uh, I love the 2004 album Reality because um, uh, I like New Killer Star. He covers Jonathan yeah. Richmond uh, of the Modern Lovers, uh, the Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso yeah. um, but uh, um, I, for whatever reason, never get old, um, mm. which is just, it's a straight ahead uh, rock single. Um, but it's got this lick that begins, and there's this moment about a minute 25 into the song that it, the song kicks into high gear, and Bowie's screaming about there's never going to be enough money, never going to be enough sex, never going to be enough <laughs> doubt, and he's never ever going to get old. And then it kind of, it almost, at the end, there's a, some stuff that almost gets into like a, it almost becomes a love song. You know, he's, right. I, I'm looking at the future, solid as a rock because of you, all this kind of stuff goes in. And I it take that song t- back then in 04, mm. uh, and now it uh, took me on a journey. Journey, and that is where 
again, uh, I hadn't heard the song in a while. And also, as yeah. I was telling you offline, my iTunes, uh, my all my song catalog got wiped out in a computer uh, accident. So I've been rebuilding my song tragic. library. Yes. Luckily, like you, I have the hard copies, mm. uh, CDs, kids, Compact digital CDs, discs. Kids. Ask, ask your parents. Um, I've been putting them back on, so I was like, ah, I got to hear Never Get Old. I got it, mm. so I tracked it down, put it on, and uh, uh, working out a couple of days after, listening to Bowie, 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 like a lot of people are this week, sure. uh, I had Never Get Old on repeat five, six times, and there's something in it. There's It's, it's something kind of spiritual about that song, and, and, and again, songs find you when you need them, um, yep. and I uh, tears streaming down my face, just, just, just belting it out along with them, and my voice is... Uh, not David Bowie's, uh, but it's, it's, I did. It's care. better, Ken. It's better. Come on, don't <laughs> sure. be modest. It's a, you know, sure, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, and uh, you know, and that's what I love. You know, that when you get into an artist uh, and you start finding those little nooks and crannies of his uh, of his or hers uh, catalog, you find uh, these little songs and these little moments. And Bowie had so many little moments uh, did um, he ever. that. Uh, just, I mean, the opening riff of uh, riff of uh, Ziggy Stardust is, is oh. uh, that that grabs you like almost no other song, um, mm. and uh, there's you know it, it's. You know, it's it's really fascinating to me that you love Never Get Old so much because the next song on that album is called The Loneliest Guy, yeah. and that's the one that appeals to me, and that is just a big sweeping ballad. Right, and and that appears more to my sense my sensibilities. I guess maybe my pop. I do like Loneliest Guy, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but that, but yeah, yeah, you're pop. Yeah, I am. It, it's true. I I am to be as sacrilegious as you can be. I am the Paul McCartney to your genre. <laughs> yes. Hey, but I'm more of a George. <laughs> we quite prepared for that eventuality. We turn the sound down and say rude things. <laughs> um, she's grotty, dead grotty. Um, Oh, so uh, that's a that's a tour through Bowie. You know one of the things I love about Bowie too. And again, you grow up. Uh, I'm trying to remember the first time I really was aware of David Bowie. Mm. Uh, the Beatles for me was '86, '87. Uh, mm. That's when I um, my my pop culture awakening was 1987. And mm. I'm a little younger than you, although if I grow my beard out, I've got a lot of gray to catch up. Uh, catching well, up to you? Oh, you got no, you'll never catch up to me <laughs> on the gray area. Never getting have there. No. Getting there. Mm-hmm. Uh, remember when I first met you? I was 22. Whoa, boy. Were you really? Uh, yeah. 22. 22, 23. You were a pup. Yeah. Your nose was cold. Yep. Oh, yep. yep. God. And that also means you were uh, not what you were now. No. Um, um, wow. But uh, no, I was in my 20s, though. Yeah. yeah I, was, right. I, I was clinging to my clinging. 20s clinging. for dear life. Clinging. But I was in my which 20s. Is, which is interesting enough, yeah. too. Um, but yeah, uh, um, a guy kind of lost my, lost my train of thought just where I was going. Uh, but but talk about the first time I discovered yeah, Bowie. Discovering Bowie. But yeah. growing, growing up and then getting into music. And then again, when I was a, a DJ, I started in 1995 so this stuff uh outside and and all that stuff that you're talking about the the, that earthling period and working with trent reznor bowie seemed fierce to me Hmm. he seemed cold and i liked it is that because he had the short the short short hair hair and a little uh, the the little soul patch patch. yep and then you go back and you look and you know when you're you know late (laughs) teens and you're getting into all right let's find out who this dave i like i like changes that song's kind of cool and you find then it's like who's this guy ziggy and a thin white duke and 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 is he or is he not zig heil in there what's going on here (laughs) and and i'm thinking so i kind of and then even knowing seeing the movie labyrinth then he's technically the villain in it though really not um so (laughs) there was a period of time even when i was a professional radio dj i was like this guy is a serious cold calculating artist love him right but I don't see any warmth in him, mm. which might have been why I didn't gravitate to him earlier. Well, as you get into just who he is and going beyond the music, I suggest you go to YouTube. Someone on there, I, I want to give them credit, but I, I have to dig it up, has a series. It's, it's, it's three parts, three videos. They're all about 10 minutes each of hmm. the funniest David Bowie moments. Wow, I haven't seen that. They're from interviews. They're from concerts. Um, uh, and it is – there's there's uh, – he used to do uh, live uh, like re- live request shows over in the UK at uh, probably a show, and he was he would appear on it. And he had, he had like a phone plugged into his ears, and people would call in and give the request – but uh-huh. then one play. There's some hilarious moments, oh and then you, I started. So just this week, and this stuff has been revealed. I mean, just the fact that he appeared in Zoolander or all that kind of stuff. Right. You, you realize, oh, he's he's got a sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, the actual 
man, I mean, to see, he's got that British wit. He's got that. He was the whole package, man. Oh, he, he really was. It, well, there was a long form video for the song Blue Jean, which came which from the 1984 album Tonight, which, again, everyone rips on. Mm-hmm. But there, there's a, a 20 minute long. It's his thriller, I guess. It's a mm-hmm. 20 minute long video for a three minute song. Mm-hmm. And he plays a, a dual role. He plays if you see the short version of the video, yeah. uh, you'll actually see both characters in it. But he's, he's basically the dorky guy who doesn't like rock in the crowd. He's got like a band aid on his nose and he's just, just a, 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 a total geek. And then but he, he's also the guy painted up in gold and singing on stage, uh, singing singing the song. He's playing sort of the dual role. But uh, I, God, it's been so long since I've seen the long form video. But he's he's trying to impress a girl. He basically yeah. says he knows a screaming Lord Byron or something like whatever the guy's name was. The guy on stage, and and you see him trying to trying to figure out what he's what he's going to wear. And he's trying all different kind of outfits on. And he's got like a Frankie say relaxed T shirt. Like, <laughs> oh, Frankie relaxed definitely not good. You know, he's going through all these all these changes. So yeah, he had a good sense of humor. Yeah, I, I was, he really did. Um, I was listening to the show uh, locally there's a radio station here uh, based out of CSUN 88.5 which is a great station it does have an mm-hmm. app you can listen to it anywhere hmm. um, but they uh, rebroadcast uh, or co-broadcast uh, David Dye's show World Cafe which is uh, an NPR show based out of Philly huh. and David Dye was playing some uh, uh, rare stuff from uh, Bowie uh, I want to say about 10 years ago or so um, maybe more um, during that time period um, played a live show for World Cafe in Philly and it's like David Dye said this is the only time you're gonna really gonna hear this we're not archiving this like it's there um, right I, I don't know if you can find somebody but he and one of his bandmates go into a little bit they're talking about the songs and some his bandmates said something about you know we have uh, you know it was like it was like we had the memory of goldfish which is three seconds <laughs> and bowie says uh, oh the, three seconds and he goes yeah and bowie's like what did you what did you say and they go into this <laughs> who's on first routine for like three minutes perfectly timed uh wow. all, just extemporaneous comedy moment and i'm just right. i'm just laughing thinking you know this this whole time of my young adulthood had this vision of this man oh, thinking wow. that ziggy stardust was a real person because yeah. he did such a good job of making it a real person sure and you read interviews with him where he said some of the stuff it took him over he, he blames yeah. oh yeah the thin white duke uh, that character for being the one who said the pro fascism stuff and all that kind of stuff that sure. got the Controversial stuff, uh, controversy thrown back at, at Bowie in mm-hmm. the seventies. Um, right. So to, to now, just now, and even now, I'm I'm rediscovering or discovering new things about this man, this myth, this legend. That I'm bl- I'm I'm blown away how just uh, funny and warm he was, and now hearing all these stories, I was like, yeah, that was the real Bowie. Yeah, and and I I read something just the other day where somebody said he just had a way of making everybody feel like a million bucks. Mm-hmm. He, he was so so nice, such a nice yeah. person. Really regret never having met him, but yeah, but he but he did have all those periods like you say you, you saw him as being fierce Bowie, yeah and, and which, which really was his persona a lot of the time except yeah. when it wasn't and then you see, you know even you see him in labyrinth it's kind of hard to take him seriously when he's got the david lee roth hair and, and, <laughs> and the and, big bulge in his trousers the big bulge in his trousers <laughs> <laughs> hit, hitting on a young nubile jennifer connelly who i think was 14 14 or 15 uh, or yeah the time. we're gonna we're gonna gloss right over that yeah, yeah. um yeah but uh, and that's part of part of who it was who he was man yeah and, and you know I, I always wondered too because by all rights he should have died a few times in the 70s he he, he said himself well oh deed several times and yeah. then i found out just reading today the, the reason the reality tour stopped is he had a heart he attack he had a heart attack apparently he had six heart attacks total yeah he had six heart attacks i i've heard the word stroke bandied about yeah. I, no one seems to really know because a lot of his last 10 years are kind of shrouded in yeah. mystery right that's why uh yeah the heart attack stopped the tour he he had one concert he uh unfortunately even had to cancel because this was not him but i guess one one of the workers uh, setting the stage up fell to his death. I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, remember that. I, I don't even know why I mentioned that. That's morbid. But, but, it's but, sort of, but, sort of but, out, but out of nowhere. I, but. I, why I'm so glad we got to see him because that was that tour. It was uh, that But tour, I, right? I remember remar- yeah. remarking uh, because he's in his mid-50s at the time. A two and a half hour show. Guys, he took a five minute break in mm-hmm. which he slowly walked off stage during a musical interlude and a solo yeah. and did this really controlled artistic walk off stage. Mm. Probably took a bathroom break got some water and walked back out yeah two and a half hour show in his mid-50s only to find out just today i'm reading going oh a little while later he had a heart attack yeah yep yep and that was one of being the last tour he ever did but even when he was 57 dancing around the stage like a teenager just just having a great old time but uh but you know talking about the legacy it's why i bring that up about why he Mm -hmm. very nearly died a few times in the 70s i wonder like i kind of wonder how people would look at him if he had like we talked about what would what would people think of the beatles if they were if if the beatles were still recording if if john lennon you know god bless was still alive but if if bowie had succumbed to the drugs or if he had od'd Mm -hmm. what i what i mean is like i 
I think about Andy Gibb, if you remember yep. him. A lot of people may Bee Gees, not. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people may not remember him. He was one. Of, he was the brother, brother of the Bee Gees, Bee Gees. One of the brothers. Yeah. Uh, totally coked out. Uh, got clean high on life. And 33 years old one morning woke up dead. Yeah. He had just his heart just gave out. Yeah. And I wonder like if that had happened to Bowie and his 70s stuff was all we ever got from him. Mm -hmm. You know, I wonder how people would look at him today. And, I, and the first thing that comes to mind is he probably would be thrown in the same bucket as, say, Led Zeppelin. And yeah. the reason I say that is, you know, Led Zeppelin, for all intents and purposes, stopped recording in the 70s. Yeah. And people still love him. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the younger generation, they probably don't know who Zeppelin is, by and large. I mean, everybody's going to know who somebody is. But, yeah. I, I mean, kids today wouldn't be like, oh, you know, wouldn't be talking about Led Zeppelin. And it'd probably be the same with Bowie. You yeah. know, oh, that guy who died back in the 70s. Yeah, he had some good stuff. Yeah, you know? I think he would have been, uh, I don't want to say written off, but I think there would have been uh, a what could have been maybe a la Hendrix. Um, yep, same. Yeah. Where broke mold. Created uh, his own art form and then left us far too soon, right. and is remembered for that positively, uh, tragically, but and remembered. Uh, you know, Hendrix has his legacy, mm. uh, but we'll never know beyond that. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, vocals always got in the way of Jimmy, as my old drama yeah. teacher Billy Hawk would say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think Bowie would have been a little bit, like I said, not written off as just an oddity, but a a, a certain time period and a what could have been. Right. Um, more known for definitely more known than someone say like Nick Drake, who oh, yeah. uh, whose yeah. legacy got revived by a Volkswagen commercial twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, but he only had one style. You know, Drake was sure. sad, mopey, yeah. British with the katoots acoustic guitar which is why i love him um right. so bowie yeah would have been put in this box mm -hmm. that i'm so glad we weren't allowed to build around him yeah yep and to use another baseball analogy uh some players when they're talking about the hall of fame and they're talking mm -hmm. about players careers uh, cal ripkin is one yeah. uh I, I, i'm going somewhere with this folks mm -hmm. even if you're not a sports fan stay with stay with uh, yeah some people say well cal ripkin didn't deserve to be in the hall because he was a compiler and by that, I mean his stats were only great because he played for so long mm -hmm. and he, he built up all these, all these stats. Other guys like Craig Biggio, oh, he was a compiler. He, yeah. he, he, he was never really great in one particular year. It was never – it's just that he played for so long. That's why he hit so many home runs. And some people would probably say the same with, Bo, with Bowie. Like, mm -hmm. Again, he had 28 albums, which is just unheard of in this day and age for somebody right. to put that much music out. Uh, and, and you could say, yeah, okay, Bowie was great, but you know – Really, only you know nineteen of his albums were any good, and yeah. and his eighty stuff sucked, which most people say. Sure. Uh, nobody's heard his stuff from most of the nineties, and yeah. the, the last couple albums only got famous because he kept them secret so long. And all of a sudden, it's ta-da! I'm back, and here's here's my stuff. Right. And I guess the beauty of it is, it, it doesn't really matter if you look at him as a compiler because you can take. Uh, the 10 albums I mentioned, or you can take just t just take the stuff from the 70s mm. and it, it's brilliant. It all of it, yeah. all of it is, is just so brilliant. It's next level. It is. It, it's next level and on so many levels. Again, mm -hmm. I mean, just look at every genre. It, it's easier to name the, the, the genres of music he didn't do mm -hmm. than, the, than the ones he did. I think Zydeco and maybe country. <laughs> and and even, even he did like a country tw twin song here or there. But, you know. I would I would have loved to see or, or hear a full Bowie um, country. Not, I, not, not, not uh, Grand Ole Opry country, but no. like um, – <laughs> You know, you know my love of Ryan Adams, but like a sure. whiskey town uh, an type alt, of alt country. Alt country. I, I could totally see him pulling it off. Yeah. Now, Ryan Adams is a guy I actually wrote down kind of when I made some like I, I sketched sure. out some notes for this. He's a guy who's prolific like Bowie. Is. I could do two hours on Ryan Adams and why I feel he is as big as legend, a uh, big as a legend of, as anyone in rock music. But we'll never get that credit because we're in a. A time where pop culture is chewed up and spit out every mm. five minutes, where you don't get to stop and recognize him as the legend that he is. Right? Um, he is prolific. He is a compiler as well, but okay. uh, and he's just not. You know, he's he's not breaking grounds like someone like Bowie or the Beatles or the Stones or the Who or Zeppelin because, you know, sometimes you're just – you're first. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. but um, I think Ryan Adams, there's someone who never stops writing and, and just last year and a half has put out some of his best work. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because – but uh, but there's not a lot like him. No, there, who, there who really is record three albums a year. Yeah. And it, it's interesting you use the word first with Bowie because actually I've heard him quote – as saying uh, that the reason he was so good at everything he did was because he always came second. 
Like, you know, mm-hmm. he, he, you really can't even use the word innovator for him because he kind of wasn't. He, mm-hmm. he was more of a reflection of everything that was going on at the time. Like even Ziggy Stardust, mm-hmm. I heard he borrowed very heavily from Iggy Pop and Lou Reed. Sure, sure. You know, like he didn't invent glam, but he sure perfected it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, the 80s stuff, he's, you know, the, the new wave and the look and everything he but he glommed onto it and he yeah. made it his own. You know, yeah. it, the, the 90s were starting to get industrial and people were people were doing more of the concept albums outside high concept art, you know, and yep. he didn't invent that, but he, he sure did it great. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think that's uh, that's an interesting point in, in hearing you think about it. It's like I, I joke about Stones going through disco period, uh-huh. um, but um, it, it's interesting as, I'm, I'm, as you're saying it. I'm thinking, yeah, I get what you're saying where he just said, oh, that's what's going on. I'm going to do it the Bowie way, and the Bowie way is going to make it better. Yeah, yeah. And, that's part of part of his legacy. Then. Yeah, he he was never really trendy, I think, so to speak. But he mm. but he did know what was going on. He definitely uh, was not trendy in the nineties. I can assure you, it, as a DJ during that time, yes, he was not trendy. No, um, it was you know, Earthling comes out and he's got the cool Union Jack uh, jacket and the uh, cover, and we're like, oh, cool, we got some Bowie, and it was like, what's he's working? Reznor was popular, but right. I'm afraid of Americans. And he 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 bravely let he recorded the song, but then gave it to Reznor and a lot of other people to remix and just said do what you want yeah and so it was some of the stuff was weird or avant-garde or everything so and little wonder which you, you know you and i have talked about i, I have a special place mark for sure. little wonder yeah Are you little wonder you yeah um <laughs> Um, no, it was like it hit with a thunk at our radio station. Yep, yep. We I, couldn't give that album away. I, I believe it. And part of it was, and this is kind of ageist when you think about it, is here is he was 50 when that album came out. Mm-hmm. And here's 50-year-old Bowie trying to do techno. Yeah. Because yeah. it really, I mean, I, I I hate using that word because it wasn't like real ns, ns, ns no, music. No, but, no. but it was very electronic and very, yeah. I've heard it like jungle bass and drums as I've heard it described. And it, and it was just not what you would expect from A, Bowie, and B, a 50-year-old man. One of my friends uh, worked, right. at, worked with in radio there was... Um, uh, more of a classic he was he worked at a rock rock station but he was not so much a rock guy as he was a classic sinatra guy so he was familiar with bowie in terms of uh, let's dance and all that kind of stuff and so we're listening to a uh, little wonder mm-hmm. which has some breakdowns and some, and some of the stuff's going on and he, right. he turns to me and my program director and goes when did bowie get so weird yeah <laughs> yeah he both just left like yeah ziggy stardust sure was normal right <laughs> yep it, um it, but yeah it, it's it's true yeah i can t- i can see that album totally going over like a lead balloon i didn't like it the first time i heard it and it wasn't yeah. so much like because i wasn't a bowie snob at that time but it was more like this isn't like let's dance i mean it, it there was nothing accessible about it it was yeah. very much like that wasn't my style of music yeah which is why i say everyone's it, it, there it, you're not going to find anybody who loves everything bowie did the only period i can say i don't like from bowie is tin machine when he did his mm-hmm. very hard rocking that was his band he they did two albums and i'm not crazy about either one. yeah and i was reading a little bit about that too where it's like he just he wanted it to be a band a democracy and everything and yeah just, he's bowie man so it, he kind of took it over and right. it just didn't didn't work it yeah. was it was his counterbalance to his 80s stuff he wanted to get back to making yeah you know some real music and it, it yeah i just it just wasn't crazy but to hear you say that like he's it. like i go into every every album knowing that uh, the, the the guy who bought the last one's probably not gonna like this one that's that's like i said that cannot be done in this corporate uh, rock world now no it can't nope. be done it absolutely can't hey can i give my uh, my 10 favorite songs yes this okay. is what i want I, is I, to I start to close this out no you're good I, I, i'm I, sure I, people if you're listening out there and you're you're a dedicated bowie fan or you're a new bowie fan i'm sure you're having fun yeah. um this is what jay and i do with a microphone or here or not right uh we used to for the new listeners and i think we talked about on the other shows we did but we used to back in the early days of electronic mail would send Mm. emails back and forth to each other about albums and songs and it would get into paragraphs we should if i still had those i'd publish them as a (laughs) as a music zine i still do have those probably i'm I'm an email pack rat i have stuff back from the 70s that we were emailing to each other oh when you and al gore were creating the internet yeah it's true hey by the way a little bowie factoid i'm not Mm. again not i don't have tons of facts toys books have been written I, yeah. I i was not the guy who wrote the books uh did you know bowie had the first downloadable single of any major artist uh that would make sense because of my roommates had bowie net yeah that's it yeah uh, telling lies telling yeah. from from the uh, uh earthling album I, yep. I think it was earthling yeah around that time yeah 98 he came up with bowie net and my middle roommate yep. casey alexander uh, i believe he had bowie net you could download that single before it came out and that yeah. that that's unofficially considered the first major downloadable Crazy. single he predated itunes see he was yep. ahead of that folks he, he was ahead of that yeah no so i wanted to throw out like my 10 favorite songs and this is the same thing these are not his best songs by yeah. any means and this is one that definitely will have the knives out from everybody listening because <laughs> i people, can like, hear them how, how could you leave out heroes how could you leave out changes you know which right. the uh, uh, spoiler alert 
alert, those two are not in my top ten. And mm-hmm. and a lot of these are are going to be very unpopular choices and unknown choices, and people leave people scratching their heads. But let me just I'll blaze right on through these. Uh, number ten is right. I mentioned right earlier from okay. the young from the Young Americans album. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that would be yeah from from seventy five. Uh, it's just very it's just very groovy, sultry song. Not high art, but it's right. great, great stuff. Uh, number nine would be I'm Afraid of Americans from from Earthling. Which now I got to say. Love that song. Yeah. I was listening to it earlier today, and I, I remember not liking to play it when I was a DJ. Yeah. Like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah, he, he does a fantastic version of it. He, uh, he had a 50th birthday bash, which there mm-hmm. are some uh, bootlegs or unofficial bootlegs. It's available out there, but he did, yeah. does a fantastic right. 96, version. 96, 97, uh, 97. I think, it, I think it would have been 97. Madison, he was born Madison in 47. Square Garden, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I don't Mashing think it was ever. Pumpkins, a lot of those people were on oh, that show. Oh, yeah, yeah. And as a matter of, he worked with a lot of young folks. Like, yeah. I guess they wanted to get the older folks around, and he's like, no, nah, I kind of want to work with the younger yep. crowd. <laughs> Um, number yeah, number A would be Quicksand off Hunky Dory. That's not okay. a real popular song, but it's it's my favorite song. Okay. Second favorite song off Hunky Dory. Uh, number seven would be The Buddha of Suburbia. Okay. The Buddha of Suburbia from the album of the same name. That's one I guarantee most people don't know the song or the album. Uh, number six, Slip Away uh, mm. from from Heathen. That's the Twinkle yeah. Twinkle Uncle Floyd. And actually, it, again, not full of factoids, but I love this. Uh, that he that Slip Away, he, it's about a guy named Uncle Floyd Vivino. He did a low-budget children's cable show in the late 70s. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 this is probably the only direct quote I'm going to read this entire day. Bowie said, back in the late 70s, everyone that I knew would rush home at a certain point in the afternoon to catch the Uncle Floyd show. He was on UHF Channel 68 and the show looked like it was done out of his living room in New Jersey. All his pals were involved and it was a hoot and it sounds like a show that was just I mean this is me talking again it sounds like a show that was just so bad it was great and yeah. everybody just loved it and, and Uncle Floyd that's, that's he says okay. twinkle twinkle Uncle, Uncle Floyd, Floyd in, in the song sailing over Coney Island <laughs> and I, I don't know it's a it's big sweeping ballad to um, Uncle Floyd uh, one, one thing I was going to mention earlier yeah. did, did you notice Bowie never really did love songs Yes, yes, which I, is why I never get old. Uh, I love that he kind of it, it's. I wouldn't say it's a love song, but it like gets it. It's, it's very odd, and he's probably behind some character wall. But the fact that there is some, you know, looking at the future, like a, it's all like a rock because of you, and it's like one of the only times you're like, yeah, yeah. He, is he, that to Amon? Is that what is that? Right. You know? Yeah. He he wrote a, he did write a lot of story songs, and he wrote yeah. a lot of stuff, but he just didn't write. Yeah, cheesy love, cheesy love ballads. I bring that up because the number four song would be Absolute Beginners. The title ah, yes. from the Absolute Beginners soundtrack. Yeah. There, there's an eight minute version and then a more radio friendly yep. five minute version. I do like that. Song. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, lo- I love the eight minute. Just big celebration of life. And he says, "I absolutely love you." And it occurred to me when I was listening to that song as I was preparing for this, going, "You just don't hear Bowie say I love you ever." Yeah. You yeah. know, he just he just doesn't do it. Uh, number three would be Loving the Alien off his derided album Tonight. Mm. Uh, that's the one that I mentioned when he did it live. He did it just a more sparse thing. I love the album version. That's okay. that's one of my absolute favorite singles of his. First, the, Probably the first single I ever heard from him that really just loved the song would crank it in my car. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, Black Star. And, okay. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. The only reason I don't call that my favorite song of his is because it's so new. I don't know what time's going to do to it. Ten, <laughs> right, ten, right, ten right, years right. from now, I'm going to listen back to this podcast and go, what was I thinking? You might be running on emotion, but it, again, the album is uh, definitely worthy of the attention. But yeah, you don't want to be like like uh, uh, Jack Black's character, uh, Barry in High Fidelity. Oh, very mm. pussy of you. <laughs> Put a new song in at number two, messing yeah. it, so covering it with the old songs. But no, but I think the uh, album definitely does, it, it's, it's, it's a, Great parting shot, man. And, so. and words cannot express how much I love that title track. It, mm. it is, it's a 10-minute long song. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a real regret. I heard it originally about 11 and a half minutes, but mm-hmm. iTunes has a rule that a single can only be 10 minutes long. And he wanted to release it as the single, so he had. A, he's like, I don't want there to be an album version and a single version, so he cut it down to ten minutes, right. and that kills me. Like, I want to hear that extra minute and a half. But it's, sure it's, it's very much a, it's very much an ABA or ABC song where it doesn't just do the same thing for ten minutes. It's like three different songs right. thrown together. Uh, absolutely, just brilliant. And then the number one song, of course, as I would think most people's would be, would be China Girl. Uh, of course, <laughs> off the list. No, it's not China. Put the knives down, people. It's not China Girl. It would be Life on Mars. Yeah, the, the, from Hunky Dory, mm-hmm. uh, orig- uh, recently shown on a uh, uh, fe- featured, I should say, in American Horror Story, mm-hmm. where the main character Jessica Lange's character in the, the prior season, where she's singing, and it's all about uh, it's American Horror Story freak show. Yeah, uh, it, the the song itself is supposedly about London. 
it, I guess mm. I've heard people say if, if you lived in England, he threw a ton of references in there that yeah. that Brits would understand that most people probably wouldn't. Yeah. I don't understand half of it. To me, it's about life on Mars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's you about know, the same. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what it, what it's about. This is what I think it's about, and that's why I love it. Just yeah. just a gorgeous song. And again, on the documentary, which I couldn't recommend more highly, which is uh, called Five Years, uh, Rick Wakeman, who played piano, talks mm. about the writing of the song and the chord changes, and just the, the genius. You expect Bowie to do this to, to play this, and he'll play a passage. He goes, but instead he does this, and he plays the different passage. But just hearing him just play the piano part on Life on Mars is is just mm. amazing. Hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great yeah, list. That's that's my. Th- those are my ten favorites. Not his ten best songs. You'd yeah. have to throw ch- changes and heroes in there. Yeah. See, I can't even put my list up because it'd just be like a greatest hits album. Um, um, but uh, as I as I've been studying him this week, knowing we were doing the show and just reading and just having close friends who are affected greatly by this. Yeah, loss, uh, which I get completely, and um, you shouldn't. You know, the, the music is so powerful; uh, it crawls under your soul, and that's why you feel you know these guys. And yeah, you yeah. don't. I've never hung out with Lennon, never hung out with McCartney, right. uh, never hung out with Harrison. But George Harrison's music got me through one of the darkest periods of my life. So the day mm-hmm. he died in November two thousand one, I bawled my eyes out uh, in public for two hours, sobbing yeah. uncontrollably. Wow. So, so this uh, he definitely affected a lot of people. So I'm studying him this week. I am so. so uh, there's some life lessons in what this man's career was, which is be true to yourself. Take those risks. To hear you say he goes into every album. Again, he goes into every album knowing the guy who bought the last album wasn't going to like this album, but yeah. he, he stays true to himself. And then see him on his birthday, uh, on his 69th birthday, in a suit. Iman's taking pictures of him, and he's got this big smile on. And mm. it, 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 the lesson for me is is play to the closing whistle. Right. Play to the end. Finish the game. Sleep when you're dead. Sleep when you're dead. And uh, to have him go out on the shield like he did uh, was uh, impressive and inspirational to me. So even in his passing, his art is affecting uh, me and many others who are ju- who are learning the new lessons of him. I, I got to wipe a tear away. Excuse me. Just, <laughs> no. It, it, uh, I, I don't really know what I can add to that, Ken. I mean, that was just that was that was spoken spoken mm-hmm. beautifully. Well, um, yeah. only because he was uh, such a beautiful, complicated, and legendary figure who affected so many people. And Jay, I'm so glad that you found the time that we were able to do this because yes. we haven't been able to broadcast in a while together. Not. Mm-hmm. But I think though those out there listening, if you uh, enjoyed this conversation, uh, but want to hear about more and about Jay and I talking about our jingly jangly pop songs, uh, you can go back <laughs> on Napsuck Files and listen to uh, what you, we did the ten songs. It's songs we need and, to live right. Yep, and we did our well, we did one just in general about music in general, yes. and then we did our ten songs. Ten and we, songs. And we did our ten uh, ten albums. Ten albums, and yeah. then I think we definitely need to do our ten uh, our ten artists. Right. And I know it's funny you said you mentioned you you mentioned that you did not mention Bowie during those previous recordings. It's because and you've heard me mention the Beatles a lot here and I'll throw references to them, but I put them in a category. Yes. That I don't it's like People ask me my favorite movie, and I answer Indiana Solo and the Fellowship of the Ewoks. It's, it's, those don't; <laughs> those movies don't count. Right? You know what I mean? Right, I can't right. compare Star Wars to you know Last of the Mohicans is another one of my favorite movies because they're different. Mm-hmm. That's a category. Yeah. Again, the Beatles are like food, uh, but I am right. someone who found them organically in a friend's birthday party. Sean Phillips hands me a CD. You got to listen to this album mm-hmm. called Sgt. Pepper. I didn't know from nothing what that right. was, so I yeah. found the Beatles organically. Uh, so I understand. And you not listing Bowie in that list, but I think uh, you know we'll put a, a, a special legacy choice, yes. and then you and I will list our ten artists after that. Mm. Um, Done. So if you out there in the Twitter sphere and the Napsuck Files fan base want to hear that, let us know. Hashtag the Napsuck Files, um, and uh, again, go back to if you're a music nerd like we are. Um, yep. And a lot of you know me now through Schmoes or Screen Junkies or Star Wars and, and Game of Thrones, and that's the stuff I love. Before all that. I was a music guy, still am, but on a level that I am not uh, now. I'm on a different level than I was then. Uh, back in the <laughs> late '90s and early 2000s, music was my life. Uh, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was like the, I was like Cameron Crowe's doppelganger character and almost famous. That was me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And uh, Jay and I love when you get come on, Jay, and we can talk about music. Yeah, it, uh, it's it's the best. And, and I do want to throw one more thing in there before do we, it. before you play the closing credits. Uh, I am not a big Spotify guy. I never have been. Yeah. I just went on to Spotify uh, just this morning, matter of fact, and made a playlist. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes uh, what I do on Twitter is I as I uh, tweet about the best song you've never heard, and the sure. whole the whole idea behind that is stuff that I mean, me personally, I love being sitting in a McDonald's. Or, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. somewhere, and they're playing a song that I've never heard before, and I find myself going, "What is this?" And it turns out to be like a ten-year-old song I just missed. Yeah, right. And so I sometimes tweet about that—the best song you've never heard. Yeah, I meant to do it daily. I do it about every three weeks. But I made a playlist called "The Best Bowie Song You've Never Heard," gotcha. and I picked one song off of each album that you probably have never heard. If you, uh, the full name of the list is "Best Best Bowie Song You've Never Heard." If you only listen to the radio. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. these are all songs you've probably never heard before, but I just picked one off of each album in chronological order, uh, including some of the ones I mentioned here today, like probably, um, I probably threw Loving the Alien on mm-hmm. there, or may or may not have, uh, Quicksand, mm-hmm. uh, Right, just, you know, if, if, you're look, if you're looking to get more into Bowie, that's one good place to start. Absolutely. If you do the Spotify thingy. And, and another good place to start is to follow Jay Arrett on Twitter, Jay On Demand. Um, he uh, has a small following, but it's a mighty following. Act now, supplies are running out. <laughs> I, I think I'm almost up to 60, and most of, most of them are just, you know, so, uh, they want me to buy their stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. right, or they're, yeah. or they're porn bots. But um, <laughs> do me a favor out there in Napsock Files land. Sense, follow yeah. Jay On Demand and talk music with him, and maybe mm. we can get Jay to do his daily list of a the best song you've never heard because I love that feeling too. I love uh, a movie or a TV show or um, you know a radio 88.5 here locally. I'm telling you KCSN is a great, there's so many songs mm-hmm. new artists yeah. but then also new artists and their old songs where I'm like what is this song and they, you can go online and they have by minute their playlist so I, then you can oh, buy it right oh, there. Fantastic. I love the future. Yeah. Um, but uh, I could talk about music forever and uh. ever so follow Jay at uh, Jay on Demand on Twitter. You can follow me at Ken Nap Napsock on Twitter. The Napsock Files is on iTunes, Potomatic, and Stitcher. If you're on t- iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review. Uh, I uh, got off to a slow start to the Napsock Files in 2016 with some work stuff, traveling to New Orleans. I could do an entire broadcast of my experiences there. I love that city. Um, so I'm just getting back into it. The three things will be back on a more weekly basis and more interviews and all that good stuff. And then Jay and I will start to prep for our uh, uh, 10 most essential artist list show we'll do that soon so uh jay thanks again ken thanks for having me here no problem it's been been my pleasure we'll see you next time